Hey YouTube believers, Chris Matt coming at you with Uncanny X-Men 101. I know back then this was just called X-Men 101 and it didn't really become uncanny until I think it was 142 around Days of Future Past. But differentiate between this and the uh, 90s run, I always say uncanny. So, Uncanny X-Men 101. And uh, are you guys ready for some classic grade A storytelling with some absolutely breathtaking Art. I'll look no further than in the mutant heroes of our maximum peril. Enter the Phoenix. And we open up on this very surreal looking panel. Let me get the page down there. And before we even just talk about how beautiful this is, it's Chris Claremont writing, Dave Cockrum artist, Frank Chiaramonte inker, J. Uh, Constanza lettering, A. Yankus colorist, and Archie Goodwin was the editor at the time. Now, I've said this in many of the reviews I've done where each issue of a book should bring new readers up to speed to where they can at least read and understand enough of what happened prior to hook them on, you know, if they enjoy it, to want to move forward and then get all the back issues. So, the way the prologue does, we see Gene's face, we see a shuttle flying in because this picks up from X-Men 100. Welcome to the last moments of a young woman's life. Her name is Jean Grey. For 20 minutes now, while her fellow X-Men sit helplessly in the ship's radiation-proof life cell, she has been piloting the Star Corps space shuttle towards Earth through the worst solar system in living memory. It was an all-or-nothing gamble that her telepathic powers could protect her from the cosmic radiation long enough for her to fly the shuttle into the safety of Earth's atmosphere. And for her friends, it may have paid off. But for Jean Grey. So right there, that is enough to give new readers an idea of, okay, they're coming in from space, something happened where Jean had to pilot, her life's in peril, the X-Men are safe, what's going on? But for Jean Grey, we don't know yet. And then here, everyone's on the same page and just the use of the reds and the yellows just, oh that's some classic work right there now after that we see the ship coming in for landing and i don't want to read all of this because claremont even though he knew how to build suspense and it was great reading it does get to feel a little long-winded sometimes but suffice it to say as it's talking about going into kennedy's airport the pacing the pacing. And then, you know, you just kind of see this shh, and you see the crash. It says the X-Men hadn't expected to make it this far. When the solar storm hit and the radiation sensors went off their skills, all of them knew that Jean was as good as dead. And so were they. But until then, they were in the atmosphere. The ship, obviously, under human control. They began to think they might have a chance after all. Until the landing. And this just cacophony of destruction and noise as the shuttle crashes. And then I love how they would do the words for the name of the book. Like a phoenix from the ashes. It just hits you. And this was back before the days of digital art. So they had to pen and word all this together. As where nowadays we don't have the adjustment lines in Illustrator and Photoshop, etc. So forth. They didn't have this back then. This was just pure practice. I was on um, Bob McLeod, who was the artist for the New Mutants in the beginning. Someone was asking about how do you get your penmanship on text balloons so perfect? Do you, what type of program do you use? And his response, practice, practice, practice. So that's what I love about a lot of the original artists, because they didn't rely on digital art as a lot of people do. Nowadays, yes, it makes life easy, but it's great to know how, how things have worked originally. Now, as the X-Men come up from the water one by one, because the plane crashes into the uh, uh, what, Jamaica Bay, they notice that Jean has not surfaced. <coughs> Cyclops is like, I'm going back for her. Nightcrawler is like, don't, my friend. The radiation more or less killed her. And he goes, you stopped me once before, Nightcrawler. Get in my way this time and I'll kill you. Because this is the woman he loves. But before anything can be said, I don't want to give 
the oomph away yet, but we see the water bubble bubbling. Colossus. Cyclops, all of you look, something's happening in the water, right where the shuttle sank. What indeed, Cyclops? As the scummy garbage strewn water glows with iridescent rainbow fire. And then explodes. And here we get the first appearance of Jean Grey as the Phoenix. I love how it's not so much a Kirby crackle, but you kind of get that energy effect that Jack Kirby introduced back in the day. Dave Cockrum and the art team here just really make it pop. You know, hear me, X-Men. No longer am I the woman you knew. I am fire and life incarnate. Now and forever, I am Phoenix. So that's just a classic panel. And of course, it's the cover. And just gorgeous, gorgeous artwork. The simplicity and yet somewhat complicated work. Because, you know, her dress, the pose can be basic. But look at how their fair, her hair almost looks like flares. The gold work on her boots and stuff. <sighs> Gives me chills every time. Now, a space shuttle has just crash landed to Earth. And the X-Men don't exactly have a good relationship with this airport because something happens, what was it, way back in X-Men 97, I think so? Or was it, let me check, yeah, 97. And if you want to know what I'm talking about, go read that book because 97's a really good read as well. So Xavier's talking about how we should probably flee the scene and get in disguise. So I, uh, I crawler, Nightcrawler uses his image inducer. But Storm says, a simple enough matter, matter of using my powers to repolarize the unstable molecules in my costumes into a star uniform. Now, has anybody, you know, in years of reading the X-Men, has anyone ever seen Storm do this again? Within the books, I cannot recall a time. I'm drawing a blank. The only other time I've ever seen her use her powers to bring up her uniform was in the first episode of X-Men the Animated Series. So I'm wondering if uh, the creative team used this panel for that idea. So if you can think of any other instances, let me know down in the comments. But it's just kind of interesting to see that this is what, back before the convoluted days of the X-Men, they had that. Now, another thing, other than this being the first appearance of uh, Jean, we see Logan buy some flowers in the... Uh, guy here he's like buy him for a sick friend that any of your business bub here is your buck i'll take the flowers and he's like you gotta be crazy you know that acting like a uh, school kid still wet behind the ears for some broad what's jean gray to you anyway someone i like and want and whatever wolverine wants he gets so you can kind of see how claremont really wrote him as a rough character back in the day he used to not have this hard of a sh or you know, as the years have gone on, he doesn't have this heart of a shell, but just look at how standoffish and prickly he is towards everyone. So if I'm not mistaken, I believe this is the first time that Logan starts to show an attraction to Jean. And he's talking about how I'll surprise her and we start talking. But before anything can happen, it says, it says um, Claremont says, not this time, bub. We told you so, Wolverine. Because you really should have expected that Jean's friends would stay as close to her as possible until they knew her fate. One way or the other. But then again, maybe you shouldn't have. After all, you've never had any friends. <clears throat> so, one thing here is I miss when the third party narration felt like it was the audience talking to the characters in the book. You know, this kind of echoes sort of like, wow, Wolverine's really prickly, and what's going to happen with Scott? And it's kind of, is it no different that you would think that all of the friends would be surrounded, surrounding Jean? I miss when the narration felt like you were engaged with the book like this, because it kind of felt like your thoughts on paper. You don't get that level of storytelling anymore. It's like, I don't, I don't know if just people have forgotten or what. I mean, check this out, life and death, it's all the same to you as meaningless, as casually disposed of as a bunch of flowers. That's some good writing, folks. 
Now, anyway, another thing that's really interesting here is Moira saying, why can't you contact Jean telepathically while she's in this coma? And Xavier says, I've tried, but every time I use my powers, I begin to have these nightmare dreams and these seizures. It hurt just to uh, do what we did to get away from the airport. So here, nobody knows what's going on because this was 1970. What was the print date on this? 1976. Speaking of which, this book now, because we're in November, officially 44 years old and still holds up. So anyway, back to the Caesars. This was Claremont's way of teasing at the Shi'ar Empire. No one, no one knew what a Shi'ar was yet, so think about putting yourself in Raider's shoes in 76 and not knowing all of this stuff that was coming. I mean, now we look back on it and we're like, oh, I would love to have experienced what this stuff would have been like firsthand. Now anyway... Scott, alone, agonizing, because he's like, all this time that me and Jean, you know, been together, in the beginning when we both knew we cared about each other, and neither of us said anything. And then when Claremont took over the book at 94, the original four left, Cyclops stayed, and he's like, I let her go because I thought that the X-Men gave my life meaning. But they're not. It's Jean. It's always been Jean. Only I never realized until now when I'm about to lose her forever. Whew. Whew, that that's hard. Now, there's a prognosis made. There's another very emotional moment with Scott that I don't want to give away. But what leads and what I like is this kind of organically, instead of just feeling forced or shoehorned, this organically kicks into the next arc that Claremont wants to tell. So Xavier says with Jean and the condition she's in, everyone's going on enforced vacation. And again, Wolverine he used to come off unglued so quick. Stick it in your ear, bub, because none of us are going anywhere until Jeannie's better. And so he's, you know, Sean kind of diffuses the thing, and because Logan uh, respects Xavier, he goes along with it. So Sean Cassidy mentions his uh, home in Ireland, which is called uh, Cassie's Keep. And look at the level of artwork on this, where they go on vacation, plane, trains, and automobiles. That's what I think every time I see the panel. But again, there was still no digital art at this point. And look at how beautifully rendered it is without 3D models or any type of digital coloring. Oh my goodness. And right here, we start to get some levity from the situation from the last couple of issues of X-Men. Everyone kind of gets to take a breath. And even Claremont says here, as everyone gets further and further overseas and doing all the trips, that they start to lighten up and they all start kind of point, uh, poking fun at each other until they reach Cassidy's Keep, which is the first appearance of it in this book. And look at how breathtaking this book panel is oh that is absolutely gorgeous guys every time i see this panel it takes my breath away that's just some great work there now we get to the villain and i'm spoiler alert because i need to spoil it because i want to do a comparison here now the first appearance of Black Tom Cassidy, I believe, was X-Men, or Uncanny X-Men number 99. But I think it was a cameo appearance. I think this is his first full appearance. I'm not 100% on that. Let me know. Now, we're going to take a moment. And as I read this, think about modern Black Tom on Krakoa in the Dawn of X books. Now that you have that pictured in his mind where he's kind of random and psychotic. Now listen here. So, cousin, you've come after all, and brought friends with you, it seems. Five flies, winging their ways into the Black Tom's web, never escaped alive. You have your orders, Edmund O'Donnell. Escort them, and make them comfortable. But give them no inklings that anything's amiss. No, Tom Casty, I'll never do that. I've done evil things in your service, but I'll no party to the murder of innocent people. Defy me, will you? 
Have you forgotten the lives I hold in the palm of my hand? The lives of those you hold dear, held hostage by your good behavior. And you dare defy me? Bang! You'll be party to whatever I tell you, little man. Or you'll watch those you love and trust die in agony. Is my meaning clear, Edmund O'Donnell? Die, cursed you butcher's heart, it's clear as crystal. You're a fool to trust him. That's where you're wrong, my friend. As long as the families are in my power, he'll do whatever I command. Now think about this. This is a villain. We can tell who's the good and the bad. Now think about how Black Tom is in Donna Bex. Think about how Xavier is. And how everyone kind of has this pod people mentality and kind of dictatorship feeling. This is why, as much as it breaks my heart, I cannot read modern X-Men anymore. It just does not do anything, does not add anything to the mythos the way this book did. Especially the banter between the X-Men. You all have they all have different personalities. It shows here as their kind of witty banner. And then of course. A witty banner in an X-Men world only lasts for a heartbeat because then trouble is amiss. Now what happens here? Who pops up? I guess you guys will have to uh, get yourselves a, a, a reprint or if you're lucky enough, an original copy of Uncanny X-Men 101. This one here came with the uh, Toy Biz Marvel Legends Jean Grey. I'm thankful, though, that I do have two original copies of 101, but I will not take those out of the plastics. So I'll be able to have a reprint like this that I can read and share with everyone. Oh, yeah. So, if you guys have enjoyed this comic book, please, first and foremost, check with your local comic shop and see if they have one of these in stock. Uh, I can tell you right now, it's not going to be cheap. Or you can ask if they have a reprint, because if you want at least a reader copy so you can enjoy the artwork and the story then by all means, please go that route as well. <clears throat> and if you've enjoyed this review, we really would appreciate if you take a moment to hit like, share, and subscribe. Helps the club channel more than you could possibly know. And if you wouldn't mind hitting that fancy little phoenix bell next to subscribe, that way we continue to upload content, you guys will get notified. Come to the channel, and we'd just love to hear your feedback and talk with you all down in the comments below or on our social media pages, which I'll make sure to leave the links down in the description below. And with all that said, I hope you all continue to have an absolutely amazing day reading, and happy hunting, true believers.